speak. Um, is anybody new here? Okay. First time. First time here. First time ever anything with regards to the mantra, anything that's singing. Is this the first time anybody's, is that, is this the first time you've ever like sang this mantra or anything like that too? Um, I've seen different mantras. I okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, like Hari Bhakta was saying, so we're going to talk a little bit about a growth mindset and uh, how to cultivate abundance. And so, like any good title or like any good thing, you, also, you obviously want to talk about uh, what the definition of, is it, of it is first, right? So, what does it mean to have abundance? What is abundance? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? Plenty of effort. What was that? Plenty of effort. Plenty of everything. Everything, okay. Everything like everything you want. <laughs> everything you want, okay. Feeling comfortable. Feeling comfortable, okay. I think it's more than you need. Yeah. Who said that? More than you need, okay. Maybe. I think it's also belief in that there's enough for others. Okay. Beyond yourself. Very nice. Very nice. To me, it's uh, that God provides everything, meaning okay. like when we actually accept what we are given, there's yeah. more to come. We can create. It's not that we're creating it; it's already out there. Everything we've ever seen in existence is already yeah. there. It's unfolding. So, like the abundance is that the abundance is for everyone, and for each person, that what that abundance is would be different, because we're all we all are one divine mind, but we yeah. all have individuality. So it's like. What you might want, what you might see as like having everything you yeah. need, is different than the next person too. Wow, that's actually way deeper than any uh, anything I thought of personally. So, <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Oh yeah, can you guys move forward a little bit? Very cool. Um, so yeah, some good uh, some good thoughts on that. Um, what do you feel like keeps us from having abundance then? If it's having everything, getting the things we want in life. Ego. Ego. Money. Money. <laughs> Self-doubt. Doubt. Self-doubt. Yeah. Okay. Laziness. Laziness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when you're having those doubts and you're having those fears, what do you feel like your mind is telling you? What are some of the things that the mind says? You're not good enough. What's the point? What's the point? You always make mistakes. You always make mistakes. Others have more than me. Okay, a little bit of, a little bit of critical. Uh, yeah, you're comparing yourself to others. Got you, got you. Okay. Um, so the reason I like, I like everything you guys are saying because I mean I feel like that's really what. When you think about the mind, a lot of what ends up playing in our consciousness is what's called limiting beliefs. And so a definition of that is actually beliefs that create constraints around our self-image, our abilities. And what I mostly like about this definition is our self-identity. So the way that we identify with particular things that we're either trying to get or obviously like we were just talking about things that uh, ways that we aren't getting it. So we're not good enough. We have doubts about ourselves. The person next to us has more. Um, some of the definitions that I actually had for abundance were things like money, fame, power, strength, a really nice car, a house, happiness. Um, I think all things that we can relate to, right? I mean, those are things that if we have, you know, a big house, like if we won the lottery tomorrow, I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us will probably go out and get a house, maybe a couple cars, right? Yeah. 
I mean, or maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just a little materialistic. But, um, but with that in mind, you know, the thing that comes with some of those, I mean, I guess, where do those eliminate, uh, limiting beliefs come from regarding our happiness? And so if we define abundance as obviously money, fame, power, strength, a really nice car, a house, and we have these limiting beliefs, what would you say the source of those things are? So, you know, some of the things that I thought were like media, family, friends, you culture. know, culture, what else? Society. Society. And obviously there where we get a lot of what make what constitutes our intelligence. So when we think of our minds, our minds are kind of like sponges. And whoever we hang around, I mean, there's a famous kind of axiom that, you know, you're the five people that you hang around the most, you know, they're kind of what you become. And so if you think of your mind like a sponge, when you're hanging around with certain individuals, really you're just kind of soaking up their energy. You're soaking up their ideas of what, what it means to be successful, what it means to be abundant. Um, and so a couple questions that naturally come up is when we want something that only brings our self temporary happiness or is temporary in nature. So money, fame, you know, are those things that can really create abundance for ourselves? Um, you know, ultimately, if they're not able to bring us any long-term sustained happiness. And the reason that I like to think about that is because obviously we identify in so many ways and so much of our life constitutes questions to derive pleasure in these things. Um, I mean, a lot of us go out to work because we want to get things in life that we feel are going to make us happy. Otherwise, what? <laughs> we probably wouldn't do it, right? I mean, so obviously there are things and ways that we identify in this world that we do feel bring us happiness. Um, and it's not that they don't. It's not that they don't have any quality of, of satisfaction within our minds or even to a certain degree within our hearts. But, you know, the honest truth is that to a certain degree, they are temporary. You know, so we had talked a little bit about winning the lotto. You know, it's like if we won the lotto tomorrow. You know, I think it was like a billion dollars or something. 1.2 billion dollars just like a few weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, we can all kind of transport ourselves into like what that would look like, quitting your job, right? <laughs> <laughs> what you would tell your boss or not tell your boss. Maybe you wouldn't even call him. Um, where you would go, what you would do. And what I think is fascinating about all that is that would probably only last maybe about six months. And then, you know, the same situation that you're kind of in now, when you have $1.2 billion, guess what? You're going to be sitting there and like, man, this is kind of boring. Now I can get everything I want. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do I do now? And so, again, that temporary happiness that we're identifying with, it's like, Really, the question is, is a limiting belief, not just the self-doubts that we're telling ourselves, but is it, a limiting, is it a limiting belief to find happiness with things that only satisfy the body, mind, and senses? Is the very essence of thinking that something's going to satisfy me that's only temporary available, is that a limiting belief in and of itself? Not just to create self-doubt, but just the idea that it's like if, if I feel that something is inherently temporary and my whole goal is to have long sustained happiness how can that temporary thing give me sustained long-standing happiness um, and so you know with that in mind I would say that true abundance as uh, was stated by somebody would in to a certain degree have to be without limitation have to be without conditions and in my opinion, have to get better and better. That's the only way that I can conceive of something have, if any, having any sort of real substance of true abundance. So where can we find that, right? I mean, I think that's the, the real question. We're all engaged in things and jobs and stuff on a daily basis that has that temporary quality that kind of gives us a taste and then you kind of win the lotto and then you're just trying to repeat that same thing over and over again. It's like, how do I, kind of one up it you know how do I make it better it's like you go to you go to Vegas and you win a whole bunch of money it's like okay how do I go back and I win more money how do I get a better job how do I just get more and more and more 
Um, and so obviously that's a substance of abundance because when we engage in temporary things, that's there as well. Um, so the good news is people have been asking these questions for thousands of years. Am I good enough? Will I be able to accomplish my goals? Where does true happiness and abundance really come from? Um, and actually one of the first self-help books of its time um, is the, called the Bhagavad Gita. So um, <laughs> has anybody ever heard of Tony Robbins? Mm -hmm. Heard of Tony Robbins? Okay, yes. cool. Um, so it's kind of like Tony Robbins on steroids. It's asking some pretty significant big questions. Um, we also know who Mahatma Gandhi is. So it has some pretty good testimonials. Mahatma Gandhi actually said when, uh, you know, he went some, through a good amount of suffering. So he said, when doubts haunt me, when disappoints me, disappointments stare me in the face, and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, I turn to the Bhagavad Gita and find a, a text to comfort me, and I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming sorrow. Those who meditate on the Gita will derive fresh joy and, me and new meanings from it every day. I feel like that's a pretty good testimonial, right? I mean, I, I wish Yami would say that if I ever wrote a book, right? Um, and so the book of the Gita, like I had said, it's, it's, a, it's a really awesome book. So the main character, um, he's basically having an issue where he's trying to get the things that he wants in life, and he's the equivalent of like a police officer or a government administrator. Um, and it's his job to enforce order within society. And so in that job, you know, if you could just imagine you're a police officer and then you kind of go to, to, to arrest somebody and then you realize that it's like your mother or your father and you actually have to take them in to, to prison because they did something wrong. Like that's the conflict that, this character has in the Bhagavad Gita. So, you know, some, some real serious challenges with kind of just trying to live a peaceful life, right? And do his duty. Um, and so the other character um, actually responds, and this is really the basis of ancient uh, yoga technology. So these ancient yoga technicians believed in what was called a pure soul. So we obviously talked about limitations, but they had a conception that we're actually something greater than the body. We're greater than the mind, and the pure soul is really, it's what's called the divine that's greater than ourselves. Um, and actually, the thing that I find that's interesting about that, because, you know, if somebody's having a bad day, you'll tell them, like, you know, don't be so down on yourself. You have so many good qualities. And usually we give that advice to others, and we completely, like, bash ourselves. I'm not good enough. This sucks. You know, like... I would never show this to anybody. You know, it's just really hard to like share kind of who we are with people because of some of our critical judgments. And what I find fascinating in this text is it actually says, so, you know, we define the soul and it says some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear about it as amazing, while others, even after hearing about it, cannot understand it at all. And so, you know, we hear all these messages maybe in our daily lives, and despite that, we still kind of have these limiting beliefs about, you know, potentially how we're not good enough, how we may never be good enough, and we obviously have no compassion for kind of our mental processes and who we are. And so I just find it fascinating because, again, you know, this was thousands of years ago that people were having these doubts, right? So it's not just something that's centrally you know, just focused on us. Sometimes we get that, like, oh, I have all these problems and nobody else does. But actually, this is stuff that people have been worried about for like thousands of years. Mm -hmm. You tell them, hey, you're amazing. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> right? And so I guess the next step is, is if this is the case, I mean, I think it's to some degree, none of us fundamentally feel like we're just complete screw ups you know, after hearing this knowledge, like what creates the forgetfulness, you know, that we're actually a spark of something. I mean, to, to hear we're a part of something and limitedly great, like you don't even have to go to some divine opulence. I mean, look around the universe I and mean, we're a part of a universe that's, I mean, first of all, we're on like a giant ball of fire or we're on a giant ball of water getting infinitely spun around a giant ball of fire at like thousands of miles per hour, like that's far out. And then you think about the universe. There's 300 billion planets in the universe, and we're on one of them. 
So, I mean, to conceive that there's something greater than, like, what's going on in our daily lives, like, isn't that hard. And so to th mm -hmm. see how we're connected to it, you know, I mean, that's not that far out of a concept. Um, and so, again, like, what creates that disassociation? What creates that lack of remembrance? Um, and so... You know, just to recap, obviously, we talked a little bit about abundance. We talked about some of the ways that, you know, we forget about it. Um, and then kind of as a last thing is how do we create remembrance? So these are some things that personally, you know, when you're trying to engage in a spiritual, you know, kind of circle and around spiritually minded people, people that you feel connected to, these are some of the things that, you know, I felt really helped me to create remembrance. And I felt maybe it could help you guys as well you know, that we actually are part of something greater, you know, not to be so myopic, you know, to really kind of engage ourselves in a productive way where we're, you know, having positive self-talk, you know, and we're remembering that, you know, like, what's your name? Arie. Arie. Like Arie said that, you know, maybe some of these things that we hold on to don't actually belong to us as much as we'd like to take credit for them, right? Um, and so here's the few ways. So first of them all is I think humility and gratitude. I think humility first and foremost, you know, because we have to acknowledge like, hey, maybe I'm not the center of the universe. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and that's, and to a certain degree, limiting beliefs are kind of a form of self-centeredness because we're taking full accountability for all of our strengths and all of our weaknesses. And so to a large degree, we become the center of everything that is our strength and our weakness, you know, and by adopting a mentality that, you know, maybe we're not the center of the universe, you know, it kind of gives other people the possibility to see how they have strengths and weaknesses and how can we work together? How can we, you know, connect on like a deeper level that's not just defining us by our mind and our bodies, right? I mean, that's obviously something that we even talk about in just a general term. So what if it's an actual reality that we can engage in? Um, and obviously by not doing those things and not by just trying to take full accountability, you know, to a large degree, you know, when we're sitting there taking credit and trying to get things, that's to a large degree where like envy comes from, anxiety, anger. And again, it goes back to that, that limiting identity, right? So when you think you have, I mean, it's like in, when you're cultivating abundance, the opposite of that is, I don't have enough scarcity mindset. And then what's the natural byproduct of that? Anger, angst, anxiety. So it's like, we have to ask ourselves a question of just kind of like a fundamental basis. It's like, we hear these things, but do you actually feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, you're greater than the labels that society puts on you? You know, your gender, your, your thoughts, your mind, you know, do you allow your mind to just kind of consume your reality? Um, you know, and I think that's, that's an important question. And the best way to test that is on a day-to-day -day basis, what offends you? You know, I mean, think about that for a second. If somebody's walking down the street and you identify in a particular way and they say something specifically like, I'm a black guy, oh, you this, that, and the other, and then I get super bent out of shape. What does that tell me about my secret limiting beliefs? <laughs> if I'm getting super bummed. Right? So that's a good little litmus test to consider. Like, oh, okay. Like, do I really identify in these ways? I can say it. But fundamentally, like, how much does it get into my core? Because ultimately our spiritual essence is greater, um, you know, as long as as long as we don't take credit for all these things. Um, second thing is association. So first thing was humility and gratitude. Second thing was association. We talked about it a little bit, but hanging out with like-minded people, hang out with people who create positive environments to help you cultivate kind of deeper thoughts and just meaningful relationships, obviously, in this, in this world. Um, you know, share your insights and realizations. You know, I mean, I, especially in this busy world, I find it kind of challenging to create deep, meaningful relationships. And I feel like a lot of that sharing, um, a famous kind of quote that I really like is when one teaches to learn. 
And when you share personal realizations, even personal anxieties, things that you have to work through, I mean, that's a great way to create kind of spiritual or just, I don't know, just like open community to really kind of work through things and kind of transcend maybe some of those limiting beliefs to think greater and outside of just whatever is bugging you. Um, and then something that we do a lot here, chant. Um, so mon means mind, tra means free. So mantra means to free the mind, free yourself from your limitations, your limiting beliefs. Um, it's encoded in these words, Hare, or so actually Krishna, you know, talking about abundance means the all attractive. Um, and it's all, and Krishna means all attractive because Krishna is the source of all opulence. So that's truth, beauty, you know, strength, fame, fortune. Those are all words that are coded spiritually within the name Krishna. And then Rama means the source of all pleasure. So when I think of Krishna and Rama, those are both things that I try to get out of my day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, and so those are so those are the two names, so Krishna and Rama. And then Hare is like an invocation, so it's like a door. And so basically when you're when you're saying Hare Krishna, Hare is like you're opening the door of your mind and kind of trying to free yourself a little bit to actually let something transcendental or greater, you know, actually into you know, kind of into your heart. I mean, it's uh, this is a devotional meditation. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, Hare is what's called in the vocative. And so when you say it, it's supposed to be said with deep feeling. Um, these ancient sages believe that, you know, really sound meditation and meditating on sound vibrations is a great way. As well, it's the way we learn, but then it's also a great way to create different states of consciousness. And so by saying Hare, in a devotional mood where you're kind of opening yourself up and then Krishna afterwards, it's like I'm opening the door to these different types of opulences and pleasure. Um, and so the mantra obviously helps to change our consciousness and then realize um, true abundance obviously isn't just dependent on ourselves. And so that's why we, uh, that's why we chant this mantra. So just to recap, so humility and gratitude, uh, association, so who you hang out with, pick your, think of your top five people. Do they bring you down or lift you up? Uh, share your insights and realizations. Sharing is caring. Happiness is only real if shared. When, when one person teaches, two people learn. And then the fourth thing is, um, you know, focusing. Having a positive sort of habit that you do. I mean, some people, you know, that you've even heard of like self-affirmations. Facebook, YouTube. I think I watched YouTube for like 30 minutes or an hour a day. <laughs> you know? They didn't have all that. So when they tackled these problems, they were in a very, like, you know, just kind of pure state. They had a lot of sincerity. Um, and so, you know, that's what I found most fascinated about some of these ancient seers is, you know, they take this stuff really seriously. And so, you know, in that way I can kind of be in some awe and veneration as to, you know, some of the realizations that they might have had. So, um, yeah. Finish. You want me to give final points? Oh, okay. Any questions or anything? Or, I mean, any disagreement? Anybody agree, disagree? Any thoughts? Yeah, I like the test, what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I know we all know that we are so, but practically, you said when somebody insult us, like, through online or face to face, you know, we get, how, how dare you insult me? Yeah. I, I, that type of thing, if you get that thought, then we are in trouble. Yeah. So basically, at the time, if you say, pause it, and if you say, I'm not this body, uh, he or she insulting my flush, I don't care. Yeah. It's just flush. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. So if you're able to separate yourself from your flush, then we all pass the test. Of course, we have to do that every time. Yeah, yeah. It's a big, I mean, it's a big test, so, you know, I mean, I'm certainly not, like, hearing insults and thinking, like, oh, turn the other cheek. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with that in mind, I mean, it's certainly ideal that, I mean, it's, like I said, it's kind of the basis of our, of what we already believe in, 
that's the basis of the Constitution, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. Yeah, at the same time, when there is a fire, you should not say, I am a, I'm a, I'm a soul, <laughs> yeah. I don't care, I can save, <laughs> yeah. fire eat my body. That's a very good thing. point. <laughs> when there is a correct satire of fire, yes, you have to save, save your body because yeah. God, super soul, lives in your heart. So it means, yes, there is a situation you have to act and save your body, but like if it's a verbal attack, you can yeah. simply say it's a flesh. Yeah, it doesn't mean you go hang out with lions all day and tigers <laughs> at the zoo. Yeah, I got you. Any uh, anything else? Any questions or anything? Yeah, they said that the Buddha didn't realize enlightenment because uh, he was practicing like self denial of mm -hmm. his body, or, like body not not body shame, but he was like he made his body like 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 uh, in the image of a person or like an enemy. And I heard that it wasn't until after he gave up those practices and just like became one with his body that he went beyond it and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, Fair enough. Yeah, I like that point because it, it does attribute to kind of an idea of, particularly in Buddhism, is that you have to give up all desires, um, which is, you know, the basis of this world is that it's all suffering, where I like when you think about it more in a positive view, you know, that's negative, but in a positive view, is that having desires aren't a bad thing. I mean, how are you going to convince somebody that having a family or Sp spreading moments of happiness is a bad thing, but it's just about what does that happiness look like? Does that happiness, is that happiness only mean it's here to like serve me and kind of my, like my issues and what's going on in my life? Or is it meaning like service to others? And I usually find that at least personally, when I can conceive of my life as kind of a, a way to serve others, I find that, you know, money and things like that don't bother me because it's something that I can actually share and, and give as opposed to just something that I can be envious of or retain for myself. Well, I kind of feel that uh, with our senses, we're able to really uh, feel eternal or, or feel infinite mm -hmm. in the sense that we're living in the present moment mm -hmm. and within each, each moment, like you just realize that everything's equal. Mm -hmm. everything's one so you realize that you yourself are part of that one mm -hmm. you know so so i don't think it's much rather than than like i feel like just like disregarding our senses but rather coming together with it and really appreciating what it is and just mm -hmm. being in the present you know yeah under i mean so much of our I, I really appreciate that point thank you that yeah so much of what we could conceive as ignorance is that it's just the misuse of things in this world, right? So it's, I mean, one example that I always think of is you have the knife, right? In the hand of a, of a criminal, a knife isn't a, such a good thing. But in the hand of a surgeon, it can actually save somebody's life. So, you know, with regards to our senses, with regards to our mind, you know, we can maybe end here is asking yourself a question of, if I accept it, you know, fundamentally I am something greater than what are my mind and senses really supposed to be utilized for? Um, and obviously, you know, cultivating a mo an abundant mindset and trying to connect with those ideas is, you know, a fundamental part. But again, what kind of what's my purpose here? I have senses. I have a body. I'm on this planet. It's in an unlimited universe. Like, what am I doing here? All right. So. Thank you guys so much.